Well, welcome everyone. Uh, it's great to see so many people here. Uh, and let's just do, for our guests, our special guest today, uh, I'm Mike Marshall, Executive Director of Oregon Recovers and a person long-term recovery. Who else here is in recovery? Come on, make it like it's last call. Who else here is in recovery? <laughs> Excellent. Who loves somebody in recovery? And who works in the recovery space? Right on. Well, um, we're excited to be here today. That's the uh, not only the uh, uh, a mayoral forum here in Portland on uh, addiction and recovery. It's evidently the first mayoral forum where they've all been together as candidates in this election cycle. So um, we should feel really honored that they've all uh, made the time to be here with us today on a, on a Saturday afternoon. Um, for those of you that come from across the state, and you may be thinking, well, why did we program something that's so specific to Portland? And it's because we want to really send you home with uh, an imagination and a vision for how candidate forums can happen, because we need to start bringing our legislators candidates to the table, our city council candidates, our mayoral candidates, and begin. One of the great things about today is they all did a little homework before they came here on substance use disorder and recovery, and that's hugely important. And we're gonna get them on the record talking about as uh, the, uh, what their vision here in Portland is gonna be um, for ending our addiction crisis. And so it's so important that um, uh, we not only do that here in Portland, but that you guys go home and do it uh, uh, at home as well. Um, I also should, in the interest of um, full disclosure, uh, uh, we have all the mayoral candidates here. I also filed to become a candidate for city council in District 2, which we're in right now, <laughs> earlier this week. So, um, and we have a number of candidates uh, for uh, city council here. Can you raise your hands if you're a candidate? Terrific. Stand. <laughs> Uh, make a point of, of, of meeting them afterwards. Um, so uh, we're, we have six candidates. We have an hour and 15 minutes or a little more since we started early. Uh, and what we're going to do is we're going to open it up and have everyone go around and introduce themselves and their, why they're running for mayor, but also through the lens of recovery. Like if you have, here at Oregon Recovers, we li like to ask speakers, if you have a personal relationship to recovery that you want to share or talk about, talk about your vision for the city through that, that lens um, and any thoughts you have. Um, but we do have about fixing the addiction crisis relevant to here, um, uh, to Portland, recognizing that... Um, uh, the fact is, is that the county gets most of the dollars for substance use disorder. And I want to do that caveat for these candidates. They don't, as, as mayor, they're not going to have huge resources necessarily. Their biggest resource is going to be the bully pulpit and, and the ability to get things done and to create um, uh, momentum towards ending the addiction crisis. We heard this morning that 21% um, uh, of Oregonians have a substance use disorder. So one in five Portlanders have a substance use disorder that goes untreated. And we rank, again, almost last in the country in terms of access to treatment. So uh, it is a crisis. We all, we all know we're going to talk about it. Um, but so let's begin. Uh, Sarah Barger from uh, 4D is going to be our timekeeper. Opening remarks, two minutes. And then I have a number of questions. Jesse has some index cards and is walking, will be walking through the audience. Uh, write down your questions, and um, we'll try and take a few questions from the audience as well as time permits. So uh, with that, I'm just going to start over here on the right-hand right side. Oh, sorry. I need to introduce everyone. My apologies. Um, one, two, three. We have uh, today uh, Mingus Maps, who is currently in his first term as a Portland City Commissioner and was previously a political science professor. Um, we have Leave Ostas. Uh, also known as Viva Las Vegas, and a, is a Portland-based entertainer, artist, and activist. We have, we have Carmen Rubio, uh, is also in her first term as Portland City Commissioner, and prior to her election was the executive director for many years of Latino Network. To my left, Keith Wilson, the CEO of Portland-based Titan Freight Systems and founder of Shelter Portland. Uh, then we have Darrell Javon Kinsey Bay is a Youth Essentials Coordinator for REAP Incorporated and community partner with David Douglas School District. And last but not least, <laughs> Jared, sit down. <laughs> Renee Gonzalez is also a first-term co city commissioner who, prior to his election, was the founder of a technology consulting company called Artifacts. Um, 
the last thing I'll say before I hand it over to uh, Mingus to kick it off um, is that if at some point in the answers to the question someone mentions another candidate, we're going to automatically give that candidate 30 seconds to respond. So if you want to give more airtime to your opponents, go ahead and talk about them. <laughs> With that, Am I up? Take, yeah, take there it away. Go. Is this Hello. thing on? Well, um, Hello. Good well, afternoon, um, everybody. Thank you so much for having all of us here today. I want to thank the organizers, um, uh, um, and I want to thank everyone who is here in this room today, especially because the weather outside is so lovely. It's been, um, I can't remember the last time Portland looked like this. Um, I see a lot of familiar faces in the room, um, and I also see some new ones too. Let me take a moment to introduce myself. My name's Mangus Maps. Uh, I'm a Portlander, I'm a dad. I, uh, my oldest kid just turned 15, I think last Sunday. Uh, and I also have a 13 year old too. Um, as you heard, I, I'm a political scientist by training. Uh, I also kind of split my time uh, being a public servant. I used to be the, uh, I used to run the Portland's Neighborhood Association system. I also used to help run the city's crime prevention program. And for the past three years and a couple of months, I have been one of your representatives on Portland City Council. I am basically your infrastructure guy on council. So I, I'm the commissioner in charge of the Water Bureau, the Bureau of Environmental Services, and PBOT. Uh, I think about a third of the city's employees work in my portfolio. Half of the city's budget runs through my portfolio, and 95% of, of, of the city's assets uh, fall within uh, my workshop. Um, I'll tell you, I'm running for mayor because I love this city and I am also deeply concerned about uh, the direction we're going in. Um, if you're a Portlander, and I know we have some folks who are out of town, uh, but Portlanders will certainly know that um, we face some immense challenges. I would argue that the most profound challenge that we face right now deal with addiction. Um, as your mayor, one of the things I'm going to be doing is uh, listening to you uh, and working with the county and working with our partners in the state government uh, to make this system, which has bro been broken for far too long, work better. Um, we cannot... We cannot provide the basic city services that we need until we uh, do better in this space. And that is what I am committed to. Thank you so much. Um, my name is Liv Ostis, which is Norwegian for Viva Las Vegas. Uh, <laughs> I am a mother and an artist and an activist. I've lived in Portland for 27 years um, since I graduated college. And I am in recovery for disordered eating. Um, I was given my life back at age 17 because I had access to recovery services. And that access was not easy. I had to drive two hours each way from my home in northern Minnesota to take part in the program. But I fought for it, and over many months, I recovered. And I understand the journey of recovery and that it oftentimes requires many attempts, that it requires courage and faith, and that it absolutely requires community support. Um, as mayor, my goal is to make access to recovery easier than access to drugs. <laughs> Obviously, I can't do that alone. I'll be relying on everyone here today and the broader community to bring this hope and healing to Portland. I know that addiction stories are often generational and that when we heal ourselves, we heal the past, we heal the present, and we heal the future, and that is what is at stake. Not a day goes by that I am not grateful for my recovery 32 years ago. I never take it for granted. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Carmen Caballero Rubio, and um, I am a city commissioner as well. Um, and I started my journey for mayor really grounded in the belief, um, a deep belief in Portland, and also with an honest recognition of where we are as a city. Um, we want to feel safe, we all want to feel safe in our communities. Um, we all want to have access to our public spaces. We want to make sure that we have humane uh, services and shelter with paths to permanent housing. And we also want our, to know that our officers and firefighters will show up when we call them, and also that they're community-centered and trauma-informed. Um, we also want our leaders, and we need our leaders here, to be grown-ups, right? We need them to work together. We need them to uh, work together to solve our most pressing problems and not um, avoiding each other, but collaborating. 
Um, I come from a very proud but humble Mexican family um, of farm workers. And uh, we came here, or they came here um, up by way of Mexico. They were picking fruits and then picking vegetables in Texas, in New Mexico, California, before settling in Oregon. And uh, my mother was one of 11 children. And their migratory life, as you can imagine, came with a lot of challenges and trauma and also coping mechanisms. And one of my earliest memories um, was of my grandfather picking us up after school each day because all of our family worked um, and parking us uh, every day after school, um, a bunch of my cousins and I parking in front of the neighborhood bar a few blocks from the house. And we waited in the car. He bought us food and candy, and we were playing with each other until we started getting fighting, you know, fighting and bored. Um, and then we'd go and get up out of the bar, and then we'd go home. You know? And as a little kid, I didn't you know, think too much about the implications of this. Um, but you know, uh, it did contribute to a family culture uh, that generational, generationally has had lasting impacts on us. Um, so substance abuse and alcoholism have really affected members of my family's lives. Um, and it's shaped us, including my cousin that used to go in and get my, my grandfather um, who died just over a year ago. Um, so this impacts all of us, and this is why we have crisis on our streets, and this is why it's personal to me. Good afternoon. Thank you, Mike. It's a pleasure to be up here. This is our first panel, so this is an exciting day for all of us just to get going. Everybody, my name is Keith Wilson, and I'm a candidate for mayor, and I'm going to deliver real change for Portland. And that change begins with ending unsheltered homelessness within the first 12 months of my administration. Not everyone who is homeless is addicted, and not everybody who's addicted is homeless, but many are. And that's affected my family. So I grew up poor in North Portland, seven of us in a 900 square foot home, two bedrooms. Wonderful, wonderful parents who worked as hard as humanly possible to care for us, but that meant we had a lot of latitude a lot of independence. That independence came with a cost. All of my brothers and sisters, we all started drinking heavily at 13. My brothers and sisters all became addicted. Somehow, I didn't. They went on to recover, except for my oldest sister. Uh, she died four years ago. And while I was delivering the eulogy at her funeral, I explained to everybody how proud I was of her. Because after 40 years of addiction, you know, she never quit. She never gave up. She always tried to recover. Now, she didn't get there. But it's not because she didn't try. And that was the most important thing that we all should be proud of that moment. But we all know 75% of all of those who are addicted, that 21%, they will go on to recover. It's a hopeful message. It is not a negative message but we have to give them that opportunity to recover. A city that hands out tents as a regular basis denies that person an opportunity to recover. When we normalize that behavior, when we normalize that behavior, we're stopping that challenging process in recovery that you all are doing every day. The magic that you're providing is so much more difficult. It's already difficult. I can't end addiction but I can end unsheltered homelessness for Portlanders to where they never have to end up on the street. They're always provided a roof so that you can help them to recover. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Darrell Javon Kinsey Bay. I work in David Douglas School District with the youth. I would like to allow everyone to give consent to be a little dis uncomfortable and have a moment of silence for those who have lost their lives in recovery and addiction. Thank you. We know the pain. We know the struggle. It's real. And everyone in the room knows that it's a fact. There's no need to um, act as if it is something that is not happening to us and through us. 
because we are all suffering. And no one is perfect, yet we strive to perfect ourselves every single waking moment of our lives. I came to Portland in 2021, met my wife in 2019, proposed the same year. I didn't have any time to waste. Bear witness. Then I had opportunity to have a son, and now we have three children together. My oldest is 25, and I'm 30. Now I have a granddaughter. Very complicated, yet exciting. <laughs> In regards to my hand raising earlier of those who have suffered um, an addiction, mine is a little unique, and it's more surrounded around narcissistic character traits wanting to control how my wife behaves, wanting to control how my daughter acts, or wanting to control how my mom does what she does, et cetera, et cetera. We have to change that. But more rejuvenation and healing justice. My name is Rene Gonzalez. I'm your public safety commissioner here in the city of Portland. In that role, I oversee Portland Fire 911 emergency management. I'm on the bleeding edge every day of the addiction crisis in our city. That means sometimes leading with hope and leading with expectations. Uh, I had to confront some difficult decisions about how we balance that in the city of Portland. I was the city commissioner who stopped the distribution of tents and tarps. I stopped the distribution of drug kits by well-intended city employees. Uh, that's not an abandonment of compassion, but that's trying to find the right balance in our city as we confront this very difficult uh, addiction crisis in our city. Some of that's informed by my family's own experiences with recovery. Uh, I've had a grandfather, an uncle, a cousin all struggle with recovery in different ways. I've seen the destructive effects it's had on families, on the innocent in the household, who through no fault of their own are exposed to some of the negatives that come when a family member, including an adult, is suffering from addiction. In each case, there is a story of redemption. There is a story of hope. Uh, and I, I also want that to be part of our story for the city of Portland as we come out of that. I do want to say also to the service providers here, that those in recovery here, you're an inspiration. I walk into this building and I see folks who have put their lives back together, often on a really rocky path. And again, we've seen that in my own life. Uh, and I just want to air my appreciation for all you do every day and to stay on the path. Beyond that, I'm a father of three to three Portland born and raised children, married to my college sweetheart, and looking to restore Portland to the city we all love. Thank you very much. Thank you. As you can see, we, we, we are going to be lucky no matter who gets elected um, mayor. And thank you all for um, bringing your personal stories forward as well. It's, it's hugely important. Um, so let's jump into it in terms of um, my first question is about sobering centers. You know, in 2019, Central City Concern closed the one sobering center in Portland where uh, law enforcement could take and drop people off. Since that time, the city has paid a consultant $1.5 million to develop a plan to open a new one, and nothing happened. Now the county is trying, and I think they hired the same consultant. Please share why you think no progress has been made and what actions, if any, you will take as mayor to get at least one sobering center open. And we'll start at this end this time with Commissioner Gonzalez. Yeah, and, and just to take a step back, you know, historically first responders have relied heavily on sobering uh, centers. Is that okay? Can you hear that all right? Uh, so by way of background, the sobering center in the city of Portland historically was a great resource for first responders. Portland police, Portland fire, someone in uh, levels of high toxicity don't really want to take them to jail, even if their behaviors is borderline criminal, want simply a place for them to sober up. And it worked very well for alcohol for a couple of generations in our region. The challenge with the, uh, com with the opi opioid crisis we're facing today, and really before that, meth, is that the care that's necessary in that sobering center is much more difficult. And for the, all of those of you who uh, are involved in providing care to those trying to sober up, when someone's recovering from meth, it is brutal. When someone's recovering from fentanyl, they often are violent when they sober up. Uh, they don't want your help at that moment. They're craving another blue pill. And uh, I think when you go back to 2019, why Central City Concern got out of it, it was the immense challenge there. 
going forward, uh, we are highly dependent on the county to articulate a path forward on the sobering center and look forward to partnering with them on that. Thank you. All right. So I want to come and express the reality here. Um, Mike, you made a clear question, and it was predicated off of why is this happening? And one of the things that's why it's happening is narcissistic behaviors. They have to be eradicated. If you are an individual who has a heart, then you will serve the people, simple. If you have ulterior motives, you will not help and assist individuals. You will judge them based off of how they look, what pronouns they use, and what sexual orientation they want to express. This is baffling to me, and I do not approve. So we have to put our money where our mouth is, and we have to put our heart in the right direction. Everyone knows what we're supposed to do, but yet we have to put people in positions of power to make those decisions that we know that they will make. And I'm that person to do that. So I do ride along with Portland Fire, and I am amazed at the lack of hope and the purpose from our firefighters, our frontline supporters. Suicide ideation among firefighters is six times that of us, and it is at a breaking point. And so I started working with the deputy fire chiefs, started working with Portland Street Response, asking them how fast can we set up a sobering center because our city has failed five years. And we have our kids, our friends, our parents dying on the street in front of us. So on day one, on January 1st, I'm going to set up a sobering center. Now, we just heard that we're setting up one through um, our county, through uh, Commissioner Brim Edwards. So I met with her on a work session and said, where are we at? So we've been comparing notes. Absent the county actually moving, a sobering center is a public safety response. It's not a part of the treatment system. It's a matter of life and death. So the county will move forward quickly. The county will move forward quickly, or we will take those matters into our own hands and set up a field hospital. So I agree with a lot of what is said up here about the issue. And, and really, let's just be real here that the reason that this hasn't happened is because we did not have leadership alignment across our jurisdictions to do this in an urgent way. And that's the truth. And so, the, the, and also the truth, um, we have a system of care that is not connected. It is not connecting the dots. And we need our leaders to lead on this issue. And we're really grateful that the state and the county and the city have come together around 25 million that was just re recently allocated for a sobering center, but that this needs to be put up immediately today. And the truth is it's gonna be about a couple years before it's actually built and operational, but we can't wait that long. We need some temporary services now. And so that means being innovative and creative of finding, temp finding temporary locations so that we can start to get the ball rolling. And at a minimum, start investing in peer, um, peer support. So um, anyway, thank you. So I'm a single mom and I work off an artist's um, wages. That's, that makes me a fiscal conservative. And I am mad, like where is this money going? Oregonians, Portlanders keep voting to spend money on these services and, it, and they don't get built. And so I would require transparency in how, where the money goes, audits. Where is the money going? Why is the sobering center not built? It's infuriating. Um, this affects, you know, not just um, us as citizens, it affects small businesses like Mary's Club where I work. It's on life support. Mother's Bistro is on life support. And most of all, the, the, the people suffering from addiction are obviously on life support. We need a sobering center. Yesterday, I like the idea of a field hospital. It needs to be urgently done. The money is there. Spend it. Um, I believe the question on the table is why did our last attempt to stand up a sobering center not happen? And Commissioner Rubio uh, uh, gave the correct answer. We tried to move forward with that with the county, and the county chair decided that that was not a top priority. I was um, furious at that. I was mystified by, uh, at that. Um, I find that to be an unacceptable answer. Literally, the services that uh, Commissioner Gonzalez provides, uh, many of the housing services that Commissioner Rubio provides, uh, a lot of the work that I do in terms of outreach just will not work if there's not a place to take folks in need. Uh, the county, for whatever reasons, and you folks probably have a better sense of what's driving the county than I do in many, sense, in many areas, uh, the county has been reluctant to move in this direction. I will tell you, 
in recent months, I think partly because the city and this council has been very firm that this is a service that needs to be stand up, stood up there kind of talking and moving in a different direction. But I'll tell you, until we get the sobering center and other services uh, um, built, um, we cannot heal the city. Thank you. Um, I, if anyone has a question that they want to submit, uh, please see Jesse here, who's over there uh, waving um, index cards. He'll collect them as well and then feed me one or two questions as time allows. Uh, oh, terrific. They're on the table. So write your question down and hold them up and he'll come and get them. Um, the next question is, is very similar, but it, it really puts a... Um, uh, really indicates uh, the challenges we're facing. Uh, according to an OHA report, Portland currently has fewer than 75 withdrawal management and detox beds. Uh, the report indicates we need 90 more detox withdrawal management beds just in Multnomah County in Portland uh, in order to meet the level of need. What will you do as mayor to build the capacity Portland needs to meet this need given the lack of SUD resources and once again, that many of these resources come through the county? And um, we'll start here with you, Keith, and then go around in a circle this way. So I'm gonna tackle it from a, a homeless lens. I think that they're absolutely critical, and certainly working with the county is gonna be a paramount issue with that. But I'm gonna take it with what happens after you exit that first detox center, after you exit Hooper. Do you know they had up to a 50% release to homelessness? So when we can't even create a homeless shelter or a high barrier where somebody who is addicted, they are asking for that moment of clarity to make that movement, and we release them to homelessness, back to that same environment that they came from, the same low barrier shelter, where we don't even have medium or high barrier shelters enough. A Bybee Lakes with 143 unfunded beds with 4,000 people living on the street tonight. So while that's the question, and that's a kind of a flip, Mike, I just want to impress upon you. We have to at least have the decency to provide a safe night's sleep that somebody doesn't have to be in an environment that's with drugs or drug dealers. So I had an opportunity to speak to uh, some of the organizations that are here. Um, Jody was one of them, um, an anonymous. And, you know, what I've become to realize that the zoning laws have to change in regards to readjust how we utilize the real estate. You know, people talking about housing and having a place to stay or putting field hospitals in the city of Portland limits, city limits, the zoning laws have to be adjusted to be able to assist the people and we can't make an excuse saying, oh, well, the zoning laws are, you know, restricting us from being able to help the people. You know, we should just help the people and eradicate the excuses. Would you all agree? Thanks. So I think so too. Well, as a mayor of a city, uh, you have to use your bully pulpit sometimes. And when we're talking about beds for recovery, this is absolutely one of the areas we have to be strong advocates for our community. Uh, just given the rate of addiction in our community, we really need a disproportionate number of the beds to be placed in the city of Portland in Multnomah County. So. Realistically, we are dependent on Oregon Health Authority for a lot of those decisions, but your next mayor needs to be a strong advocate that those services are being brought on where the crisis is the most acute in the city of Portland in Multnomah County. Having said that, this is a regional and state problem. Uh, we can't just leave Eastern Oregon, Central Oregon uh, out in the woods on this. Uh, when we talk about youth recovery beds, Really, the only place they're located is currently in Multnomah County, is in, in, in this region. So we do need to support that getting statewide. Uh, but at the end of the day, the mayor's got to be the largest uh, advocate for those services coming online in our community, and I'll be that loud advocate. Thank you. Um, I, I would do two things. First, um, I, I think Commissioner Gonzalez is right. You certainly, uh, your next mayor is going to have to collaborate and talk uh, loudly and strongly to the governor and the state legislature about the need for uh, more beds and more capacity here. Also, I would say locally, uh, one of the most important things that we can do 
in collaboration with the county is is as we uh, work together to solve our houseless problem uh, we uh, I think that we, we should uh, bake into our agreements the assumption that we build more detox beds we can do that frankly those are conversations which are happening right now um, and uh, frankly I will not sign a new joint co uh, joint office contract unless that increased capacity is part of our agreement yeah I agree both with what Mingus and Renee said that we look collaboration with the county is clearly imperative right now. This is largely a county um, matter. And I, um, Willamette Week did a great article about the Massachusetts method, I call it, how it is from the state, the governor down, because this is a statewide problem. And if we have resources that are coordinated, we can spend a fraction of the cost to have better results. Um, we need every step on the path to recovery funded. So there's a continuum. It starts with a sobering center, detox beds, sober housing, every one of those needs to be funded and staffed. It has to be a whole network. And um, I think one thing would be to provide free education for people who work in those services, give them raises, because those people aren't there, frankly. They're not there. So yeah, gotta think big. Thank you. Thank you. So I agree with a lot of what was said, and I, and I absolutely agree that we absolutely need sobering centers and to be, um, prioritized as issue number one, but beyond just sobering centers, we need the system for it to actually work. So we need the sobering centers, we need the detox and stabilization centers as a part of that system, and then ultimately we need recovery housing and to invest in that as well. And also post-recovery support and treatment. Like it is not just a one and done. You need the entire system. That's why we have a broken system right now. Um, the other last thing I'll put a plug in before my time's up is that we also need more recovery we need more um, sober centers. We just can't plan for one. We need four. We need one accessible in every corner of our city if we really want to tackle this issue and make a consistent, long-changing generational difference. Um, thank you. A lot of conversation there about spending money. So, uh, and as I mentioned at the outset, you know, most mental health and substance use money is flowing through the county. Do you have thoughts on potential lines of revenue for the city to pursue or existing lines of revenue that would be better earmarked for building the city's addiction recovery system of care. And we'll start with Carmen and go around this way this time. Sure, and in prepping for this, um, I learned a little bit more about the um, opioid settlement, which should absolutely be linked to substance use disorder, number one. Um, the city has started receiving these funds, and um, before I uh, get into this, I just want to give a quick shout out to all uh, the advocates and attorneys who are pressing really hard every day to hold these um, producers of drugs accountable to our community. And so that uh, $2.6 first million dollars that came to the city was invested in Portland Street Response, but that should just be the beginning. I see this as a potential ongoing source to fund our most critical infrastructure needs, including the sobering center and that system that I just spoke about. Um, tough question. Uh, I, I tend to think we go about these things backwards. For instance, uh, for every dollar spent on early childhood education, the data says we, are, we save $11 on addiction services and healthcare later in life. So we're already funding that. I think that's very important. And um, so like two days ago, I got my car broken into down by Bunk where I work. And they, they didn't take anything out of the car. They wanted the battery. The battery is worth $30 for the metal and that's, that people are so desperate that um, I just like to have a, a place where people can use drugs and have access to services there, I think will actually save us money in the long term and I think it's a radical idea that the time has come to consider. They do it in Europe and it saves money. It would save me hundreds of dollars repairing my car and it would connect people to services for a relatively low investment. I, I very much agree with Commissioner Rubio about uh, the opioid settlement dollars. I also think that the answer here is not necessarily more money from the city side. Rather, I think one of the most important things we can do is demand more accountability from our, frankly, county partners um, in this uh, in this space. Frankly, the county is our local health authority. Uh, we don't get funds for this. Uh, 
it's one of the reasons why you know I'm laying off people at Peabot. It's one of the reasons why Commissioner Rubio was laying off people over at BDS. It's one of the reasons why we have huge problems over at Fire. Uh, frankly, the county has not moved into the space in the way that they should have, and so we we take dollars for basic uh, city services, and we move, basically are moving into uh, territory that the county is legally set up to respond to. Um, I think the solution here is to do a better job of working with our county partners to make sure that they're providing the services, including supporting all the service providers uh, that we see in this room, to make sure that we're building systems that actually work. Thank you. One area, one area we've had recent success in Portland Fire is working with CARE Oregon. Uh, they're funding our phenonorphine pilot in Portland Fire. We're literally administering this on the streets of Portland, getting people working with ch Central City Concern. And I think that is a, a very positive path forward on the medical side of addiction recovery. Um, that's entirely funded outside the city's general fund uh, with the good partnership at CARE Oregon. Secondly, I think that uh, I, I echo Commissioner Rubio's call on ca uh, opioid settlement. I also think our cannabis fund that we have in the city of Portland needs to be reconsidered how we're allocating some of those dollars. Um, the medical dimension of the addiction crisis is, is vastly understated. And uh, we often want to run to behavioral health, but when you're talking about this uh, high level of uh, addiction, we need the medical component of it. Last but not least, we do have some big uh, imbalances in our region in terms of tax revenue, and I think we need to be more thoughtful in how we allocate that, including, was that me? Ah, that was time's up, all right. So in regards to the question and what has been shared, um, you know, I work with the youth. I work with some of your children and grandchildren, and some even maybe great-grandchildren, and getting a one-on-one -on -one look at the issues that they're dealing with, go into Viva's statement that it's a preventative measure to support the youth so that they can get their mental challenges overcame, become peer support specialists at the age of 12 and 11. Going through IPS training would be awesome. I just got it done finishing a whole week of the training. It's important for everyone to have that um, expertise and perspective of that worldview in dealing with mutuality. Um, moving forward from that, I think that it'd be very important to stress that we have to pay close attention to how we are doing. You know, we can't be scapegoating. It's always so hard to follow Jarrell because he's got such a great delivery and calm and demeanor and then I'm kind of really fast paced and everything. Uh, I think that the, uh, kind of like Voldemort, the unspoken name of the room is, is, well, should we be taxing the use of these products at the same rate that we have to spend for the addiction of those products, right? We're so upside down on that. That's the unwritten or the unspoken point. But let's talk about just efficiencies. 50% of every arrest last year was somebody who was unsheltered, oftentimes with addiction. $2,000 to just put out that warrant for that person's arrest. We spend $25 million in firefighter overtime, $10 million in police overtime, $12, 12 million, forgive me if I said thousands, $12 million in camp cleanups. That's waste. That's waste in our city. It's waste in our system. And we're not providing care to citizens. We're just cleaning up after a failed system that we have and we're part of. We don't have to tax ourselves into being efficient, but we have to be mindful of where our money is going fix the bottleneck, and provide care for our citizens. I'm going to ask one more question, um, and then we're going to, uh, Jesse's going to hand me uh, some audience questions. Uh, and this is a topic we heard about this morning, um, alcohol. Who here is in recovery from alcohol? It's a much bigger issue than um, uh, most people, the public understand, right? We all talk about fentanyl and meth all the time, but alcohol is the driving force behind this addiction crisis. Um, Portland is closely identified with craft uh, breweries and, and craft distilleries, which are viewed as a driving economic force. 
The truth is that six people die each day in Oregon due to alcohol compared to two to three fatal drug overdoses. Neither are acceptable. According to an Echo Northwest report, excessive drinking alone is costing the state economy $4.8 billion annually, half of which is in lost income to employers in terms of uh, uh, worker productivity. Um, uh, half the people in our limited detox and treatment centers are there due to alcohol. And yet, unlike cannabis, the city has no ability to tax alcohol to pay for services. As mayor, would you advocate to lift the state preemption on al alcohol taxes so that local communities can decide for themselves, as they do with cannabis, whether to increase alcohol taxes? If not, why not? And it's not a question to ask you if you support raising alcohol taxes. The question is, would you support the city having the ability to make that decision for itself? And if not, why not? Uh, and we will start with Liv. Liv. Liv, 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 Liv. There's a, so for people suffering from addiction, alcohol is a necessary drug, so it, it, it worries me to tax it higher. Maybe a luxury tax on very expensive alcohols that are luxuries and, and people don't need as medicine, but when you are suffering from addiction, your drug is your medicine, and I don't agree personally with making that harder to come by. Then we have more incidences like I experienced yesterday, two days ago when my car was totaled. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I'm going to say no, but I would, I would continue to hear more from Portlanders about it. So I would be really open to the conversation. I don't know a lot, a lot about this issue, uh, but in preparing for this and talking and uh, with Oregon Recovers, I, I'm interested in learning more. Um, I do kn know that our, I think we're the fifth lowest rate in the nation. Is that true um, for the rate of the tax? Uh, we have the lowest beer and wine tax. Okay, right. So, um, so I think it's worth exploring, particularly as it relates to funding specifically sobering centers and that treatment continuum. The question is, would I be supportive of it, or uh, would I allow the advocacy? And and the question would be, uh, pardon me, the answer would be yes. You know, we have to find a reliable funding stream to address those 90 missing beds in Portland, and, it, and I think we all know that addiction affects all of us, whether it's personal, whether it's our family, or whether it's our friends. And to not have the resources to provide just basic care and then to see our overdose rate reach record levels, there's a cause and effect. We have to have a realistic conversation about the price of our alcohol, because that's the key, key point right there. Um. I would say that we need to do that. There, there has to be more of a conversation, though, um, and I think it is asinine for us to think that the money that we have in the city and in the state and in the county and the country is not enough to fix the problems that we've created with all the money and the printing of dollars with, through the Federal Reserve. Like, I think it's just a little ludicrous to think that that's not a thing. Um, money is flowing everywhere. It's just a matter of who has it and who has the ability to manipulate the market. Um, uh, it's, we have to be more intentional and we have to continue to stop scapegoating. We can't be scapegoating. We are city members or members of the city you know, in Portland and we have the opportunity to make this a reality. This is not some big, huge monster that's gonna eat us. We can take care of business, so let's get active. So with respect to the question, preemption, uh, sure I'd support removing preemption on this issue, but that doesn't mean I'd turn around and tax uh, that distribution in our region tomorrow. Portland is currently the first or second highest tax region in the country. It is driving away employers. It is driving away some of our biggest earners. It's driving away some of the biggest contributors to things like Bayview Lakes. And we have to take that very seriously as a community, what we're doing in terms of our tax burden. We've already gone too far, frankly. Uh, when we talk about the challenges of alcohol in particular, uh, we, we saw astounding usage rate ex explode during the pandemic. We have to reestablish the social fabric. We have to reestablish economic expectations and hope in a community. I think that's gonna be a big part of confronting alcohol. We can't minimize the use. It has been too normalized excess to drinking for sure. There's no two ways about that. But the part of that's restoring economic opportunity, 
hope and returning to uh, engaging as a community. Thank you. Uh, this one's easy, so I can be short. Yes, um, I completely, local governments should have a local option about it, the degree to which we tax alcohol. It's odd that we don't. So questions from the audience. Um, uh, and several people asked a, a different variation of this question. So will you as mayor support the public will uh, of enforcing involuntary hospitalization for those with substance use disorders? In other words, will you uh, uh, support families being able to go to court to compel people to get treatment? And uh, we'll start here with uh, Burrell. This is a tough one um, because, uh, you know, having agency and, and, and restoring human dignity is vital. I mean, all of us probably at one time have been in trouble by a parent and they told us what to do and how it made us feel. Um, so I think that individuals should have someone like a, not a guardian at litem, but something similar, maybe a, perhaps a peer support, uh, to possibly assist them and engage with them in their growth and development and their journey. I think that would be magnanimous, wouldn't it? Um, so that's my thought on that. And uh, I want to just stress, regardless if I don't win this election, I need you all to understand that it is our Everyone say our. our responsibility. None of us are the only people that are going to get the job done. We have to work collectively and hold every one of us accountable, even if we don't win, hold us accountable, because my words have to be followed with action. Thank you. You know, hearing the heart-wrenching stories of parents that are trying to intercede in their child's self-destructive behavior and can't get them to voluntarily participate in it, it's heartbreaking, and that is one of the stories here when we talk about this issue. The simple answer is 100% yes. We need to give family members, we need to give the state more op opportunities to intercede when people are engaging in really self-destructive behavior. We have the highest standards in the country preventing the state from interceding in that, preventing families from interceding in those events. So unconditionally, 100% would I support uh, lowering those standards for the state to intercede and for families to intercede to literally help them save their children's lives in some of these situations. Yes. Um, this is, frankly, I th one of the reasons why our current system is uh, not working. I, th I think uh, we need to have some change in the space. Obviously, there should be legal protections. However, um, frankly, I don't think that we can move, move Portland forward uh, to where we need to be unless we change the status quo. And that's an important change that needs to happen. I'm going to have to agree with Commissioner Ming Maps and Commissioner Gonzalez. I think that um, involuntary hospitalization, unfortunate as it may be, um, maybe is the moral thing to do with some of these people who are lying in the streets. Um, I work at Mary's. I see it every time I go down there. It's terrifying. They're not going to walk to the hospital and say, please take me in. They're unable to. And what is compassionate? What does compassion mean um, for the families of that person, for that individual, and for us as a society? Our, our fabric is shredded. Downtown is, is a, a nope zone. And I think, unfortunately, this is a way forward. And I'm surprised to learn Oregon is last in the country. And it, or it has the highest barrier to um, entry for involuntary hospitalization. I would say that in, in some instances, yes, I would support that, particularly as it relates to vulnerable people or people um, that cannot help themselves or they're, they're uh, presenting a danger or a concern. I do want to caution, though, that this is a, that whatever policy we explore, that we have folks in recovery at the center of those conversations so that we are including people with lived experience to actually help design and avoid any unintended consequences with such a policy. So involuntary hospital hospitalization, now that's the stick. But it's, you have to start with um, assisted outpatient treatment, going right to involuntary hospitalization when somebody might respond through a court order, through Nan Waller in the, our um, behavioral health court. You got to do it in incremental steps. So the answer is yes, we need it, but it's a part of the continuum. It's, the, it's that 
end result, if somebody doesn't respond to assisted outpatient treatment, we have so many people walking down the street from behavioral health crisis. And when you have that, you almost always have an addiction crisis with that same wraparound, right? If they're going to end up in the criminal justice system, let them be before the judge. Let a mother and a father or a caretaker participate. And if that person agrees to assisted outpatient treatment, then we move that forward and we create that caretaker to help that person through. Only if they violate that AOT that California has, that New York has, then we focus on the involuntary hospitalization, but only as a threat if they're not going to respond with their family members, right? Just give a mother an opportunity to care for their child. We don't even have that in, in, in Oregon. Now, Oregon is one of only 13 states without this. So two-thirds of the state in our union has the involuntary hospitalization or at least the threat of. Definitely a, a challenging issue for a lot of folks. Um, uh, next question is, and I'll add a little context or, or addition to this, which is the governor, the mayor, and um, the county declared a 90-day fentanyl crisis in, I believe, downtown Portland. And I'd love to hear everybody's thoughts about that action. And the, que the question from the audience is, will you, how will you be working with our neighborhoods versus just focusing on downtown issues and why people living in the neighborhood should care about uh, an extra focus on downtown? Um, and so we'll uh, start back with you, Mingus, I believe is where sure. we started. Um, I'll tell you, I've been at the table, um, and if my bureaus, uh, particularly Peabot, have been actively supporting the 90-day the uh, fentanyl emergency. Uh, we're making good progress here. I'll tell you, uh, we, have fentanyl, we have a fentanyl emergency across all of Portland's nearly 100 neighborhoods. Um, as we uh, make progress downtown, I think the lessons we learned need to be expanded out to every corner of the city. Really been proud to be part of this work, as is. I think all the incumbents at the table have played a role in this space. So uh, I support the fentanyl 90-day uh, um, emergency. I want to expand it to every neighborhood in the city. So when we sweep the house lists, where do they go? Where, you know, you move them from one neighborhood to then they're in another neighborhood. So this 90-day fentanyl crisis, a part of it, they closed the Safeway bottle drop. Uh, my friend who's a PhD in addiction medicine, she's like, that's why your car got broken into because they can no longer return their bottles. And I know um, my friend who is neighbors with Mingus, she's like the plaid pantry in my inner Southeast neighborhood is flooded with people trying to return bottles. So they're, the, the, the problem just moved. It jumped the river, now it's in inner Southeast. And then when the, the 90 days is over, it will probably go back downtown. It is, however, important to address downtown because that is kind of our center. We, money flows from downtown to all of our neighborhoods. So I do think it is a great importance to address the crisis down there, but also not to just move it to our neighborhoods. I'll say it again, I agree with the comments so far. Um, it, was, it was absolutely important to start in downtown as the, as the financial hub for the city uh, in some respects. However, we do need to have it quickly followed in all corners of the city for the, the exact reasons that we don't want to displace the problem somewhere else where there, there isn't the funds or the political will in those parts of the, the, of the neighborhood. All parts of our neighborhoods need access to the same kinds of strategies and responses and not just ones that get the most attention. So regarding the 90 day reset, to me it's just a half measure. Addiction isn't gonna go away in 90 days. We're not gonna address the dealer supply in 90 days. It's a half measure and it's dodging the longer term hard work of addressing that real tragedy on our seat. So I went for a walk down the park blocks a few weeks ago, Sunday night, talking to the young people addicted to fentanyl. I asked every single one of them, do you need treatment? Can I help? I've got a shelter. And they're like, please help, I want out. It's brutal for these young people. And so now when I still see the dealers walking up and down Park Avenue and we still have a 90 day reset, what does that mean? To me, it seems more like marketing for us, for the housed. But it's not really helping the people that are addicted with the resources to help them out. And then what happens on the 91st day? Does that mean we reset and we go back to what we were? It's a lot of money. It's a lot of talk. But I don't see anything systemically coming from it. Because what about my son who's 18? What's going to happen in 
five months when he's out and happens to come across something of this nature. We need a systemic approach to how we're addressing these crises. As a Moorish American Muslim, um, in my faith, it is important to revitalize and uplift human dignity. That's a, gonna be a huge trend. More rejuvenation and healing justice. Let's let that vibe your spirit. So, we've been in a state of emergency since 1865. All right, let's be clear. Let's be clear. And prior to that as well. Um, however, when it comes to you know recent more contemporary times in COVID, right? We had nowhere to go and had no plan of action, right? And again, we're going back to what I said earlier about the real estate. There's a lot of entities that own real estate in Portland and they're not anyone in the room here unless someone has some vested interest in those properties. Perhaps. I don't know. But that's something to just think about and ponder. I think the 90-day emergency was a lot of political theater. Um, it was a lot for show. Uh, having said that, some good things are coming out of it. Uh, I do think it's leading to better integration of response at the city and county level. I do think it's uh, facilitating cooperation between Portland police, some of our social outreach workers, and our medical inside of fire. So it was a lot of trying to put lipstick on a pig, uh, to be honest, but it's, it's leading to some good things that, I've, uh, that I'm hopeful are gonna be sustainable coming out of this emergency declaration. With respect to the city as a whole, and frankly, the state as a whole, uh, yes, downtown has a multiplying effect uh, in terms of economic contribution to the region, frankly, to the state, uh, but we cannot just dump this into the neighborhoods. It is a city, county, state, and regional-wide crisis. Frankly, it's a national issue, and we need to treat it as such. So this next question is true of virtually every department and bureau that you all will be interacting with, but how do you propose um, uh, obtain, maintaining qualified staff to allow treatment centers and, and housing to function. Uh, you know, the uh, folks that work in the recovery space are some of the lowest paid in um, uh, the addiction field, even, and, and there's been real progress, progress made in raising um, salaries over the last few years. It doesn't change the cost of living here is so expensive. Are there innovative things the city could do to help um, uh, us to retain and develop uh, more staff um, whether that's through housing or other uh, potential city programs. Um, and we'll start over here this time. Yeah, we're, you know, one of the discussion points is how do we stimulate more housing build in the city of Portland, whether you're talking uh, workforce housing, low income, or market rate. And uh, I think there's some opportunities when we do deals with developers, approve uh, a project going forward, uh, that we mandate certain uh, amount of space is going to be available to first responders that are those that are social workers, those that are uh, public school teachers. So I do think there's some opportunities there. Uh, it's not direct funding from the city, but uh, many of the developers I know actually would love to embrace supporting people who are supporting our community. Um, and I think it's one option on the table. So one of my initiatives is the socio-ecological infrastructure, and it's surrounding around agriculture. Uh, the USDA is making some high-level adjustments and in innovation in regards to providing support to local communities. My father is one of the commissioners for the uh, Farm Service Agency, and I believe that we can bring more life into the soil that we walk on and have it actually feed us like it did for the last 150,000 years. We should be able to provide our own food and we should be able to support people in being able to eat right and think right. That's how we start getting recovery when you have quality food to be able to eat. A couple things, as far as wages, absolutely. You know, this segment is traditionally underpaid, um, which, gives you the thought that it's undervalued, and that is absolutely not the case. It's, uh, it's very difficult work, so the wages should be higher. How you get there is uh, the challenge. But what I'd like to focus on is just a housing component, so I'm just gonna tackle that. How do we create more workforce housing so somebody who is a young person or is in recovery wants to help or work in this industry? 
One of the things I've been proposing is home sharing. There's 190,000 empty rooms in Portland. Just taking 1% of that adds 1,900 units back to the community. My proposal is to give a homeowner who wants to convert a room into home sharing a $3,000 conversion to just give them opportunity to add it quickly. We could do this in a matter of months. Just think about our Portland housing bond. $258 million for 1,900 units. To give a homeowner $3,000 to add one door of inventory would only be $6 million. We could rapidly develop affordable housing. That's about $800 in rent per person. It's our way of getting inventory on the market fast to address the affordable housing crisis in our city. So the question is about um, housing, and what was the first part again? So it's, it's about um, the fact that retaining staff is really, really hard because of wages, and I suggested housing is one of the things Thank to look you. at, yeah. Thank you. So I absolutely support, you know, uh, frontline service workers and uh, providers need increased wages to meet the need of today, full stop. We just need to make sure that our workers are paid exactly what they deserve, especially dealing in this new climate with these new um, challenges in, in front of us. Um, we also need housing, uh, worker housing, just like other folks have said here. And the city of Portland actually has a really great track record of affordable housing. And we need to be innovative and look at the funding streams that we already have and see how we can be more creative during this time of challenge um, for the city. I'm very interested also in looking at uh, downtown as office buildings are emptying out. We need to look at um, um, those office building conversions into housing to like reinvigorate our downtown core and create a culture of livability and safety and affordable workforce housing there. That was exactly what I was gonna say, Carmen. Um, I, yeah, downtown is a ghost town and that could be housing and that could be a very vibrant neighborhood if we put those people, those families in those buildings downtown. So like have an urgency redoing the zoning laws, making those buildings have a tax break so they rezone re them to, to, for, for housing. And downtown will come back and their hope will come back. Maybe artists could afford to live down there. And yeah, maybe people who are in recovery services and nurses and peer support workers, obviously they need raises, but they desperately need to be able to afford housing too. So make sure those people want those jobs because they're paid well enough and they have a, a wonderful place to live in a wonderful city. I absolutely believe that the folks who actually provide services need, don't go away, but I'm about to refer to you. Um, uh, uh, the, the folks who uh, provide these services uh, deserve a fair rate. Uh, frankly, uh, the, these services are funded by the county. Uh, I, I, there's at least one county uh, candidate in this room, and one of the things that I'm doing, and I'm going to do, and I'll do it right now, is is to have a conversation with Mia Deem and tell him, listen, you've got to get this this uh, program and these services right. One of the chronic problems that we all understand, and I think you know this too, is, is that you're losing staff, the folks who you actually serve are, are most vulnerable Portlanders because they're not getting paid enough. This is something you just got to bake into your budgets, please. Uh, and I, I'm confident that, that you will. And I also agree there's a larger uh, affordability crisis here in Portland. It's largely driven by the lack of housing. We need to both build affordable housing, but also part of the solution is just to build more housing. And one of the challenges in Portland is that it is too difficult to build. Uh, so we need to, and Commissioner Rubio and I have worked really hard to clean up the system a little bit. We need to streamline our permitting system. We need to simplify our permitting system so it's possible to build more. Great. Um, so we are uh, uh, coming up on time, and so I would like to give everyone two minutes to close instead of 90 seconds, as we originally said. It doesn't mean you have to take your, your extra 30 seconds, but. Um, and why, uh, Carmen, why don't we start with you and then we'll go this way and end with Keith. Portlanders deserve um, better functioning systems. As the conversations that we've heard today, we need uh, detox centers, we need stabilization, we need recovery housing, we need all of it. Um, but we also need these systems to be trauma-informed, and we need elected leaders that are trauma-informed as well, who will take responsibility, even when it's not in their jurisdiction to do so. Um, and helping to solve these problems and to create more on-ramps to recovery. So I will take on that responsibility and I'll bring that lens of trauma-informed, community-informed and people-centered uh, perspective into that work. 
it's time for us to be better than Portland's best. We have our best days ahead of us, and I know that um, I'm hopeful and I'm confident that if we work together, we can create that vision for Portland, turn the page, and get us back on the road to a thriving community. Thank you. Thank you all for having me, first of all. It was really lovely to be here and hear all these ideas. I'm really grateful to be up here. Um, yeah, I think we need to have transparency in how our money is spent and to address these, the lowest of us. We're, we're a chain and we're only as strong as the weakest link. So let's make sure that these people who are hurting the most get services and that we remember they're part of our community and treat them as such. Uh, the houseless crisis, is, it's a crisis of houselessness, it's a crisis of hopelessness. So we gotta, we gotta center around hope. And that's gonna be my message going forward in this campaign and arts create hope. <laughs> Well, again, I want to thank the organizers for uh, making this event happen. I want to thank uh, you folks for making, for engaging in this conversation. I'll tell you, when I am mayor, one of the things I'm going to focus on, and frankly, this has to be our top priority, is to get that detox center or the, and those detox bed, beds set up. We also need more sobering uh, um, beds. Uh, we also have to have a huge surge on houselessness. Frankly, one of the ways that we get from here to there is to hold our friends at the county account. Uh, um, that doesn't mean that there aren't some things that the city needs to do better too, but uh, that's one of the things that is uh, uh, frankly missing. And as we build out this new system, one of the things I want you guys to hear is that we need you at the table. We're, uh, I think a lot of the drugs that we're facing out there and the dynamics uh, uh, that we face today are truly unique. You are the experts as I build this. This is not just gonna be a conversation between electeds. It has to be a, a conversation amongst all the people at that, this table, which is why I very much appreciate the conversations we've had today. Um, I also, uh, I'm gonna make a, just a flat out plea for your vote. Uh, um, if you like what you heard today, uh, um, please uh, vote for Mingus Maps. Not, I mean, Mingus Maps, if you want to learn more about my campaign, go to MingusMaps.com. Uh, I'm doing public financing for this race, too. So when you go there, if you could hit the donate button and uh, throw 20 bucks uh, towards this race, uh, I think that we can actually come together and change this city. Thank you. I just want to th thank you all for your attention and your uh, commitment to recovery. And I think really the story for Portland today is we're, we're need to enter recovery. Uh, it, it, this has been a profoundly difficult part of our city's history the last four years. Uh, never seen anything like it in my adult lifetime. And at times the city shook at its core. And whether we're talking the addiction crisis, gun violence, the houseless problem, so many things all at once. And so as we look forward to the future, I think it's also, we have to recognize this is a tremendous opportunity to redefine what an urban setting looks like post pandemic. That is a once in a lifetime opportunity for most of us. We inherited a beautiful city. It's come on hard times. It's struggling, but it's now time to lift it up and work together to build a vision that's gonna unite our city. I will be steadfast in protecting livability. I will be steadfast in protecting places for, where children can grow where seniors can age in place, where builders and creators can thrive. I am unapologetic about that. That also means, at times, holding people accountable when they step over the line. I will fiercely go after drug dealers in our community who prey on the weakest among us. We will set firm expectations about behaviors in the comments. And again, that is not an abandonment of compassion but we have to balance clear expectations of personal responsibility in that compassion. As all of you know who've gone through recovery, we have to thread the needle on those two pieces. With that, Renee for Portland, would love your contribution or just check out my website. Thank you very much. Here we are again. It is a very historic time. I want you all to remember my words. I'm the youngest mayoral candidate that's going to be mayor and I'll be the youngest mayor in the history of Portland. And I say that because we talk about helping the youth talk about changing the future. And the future is here in full manifestation before your eyes. I'm here. And I respect my elders. That's why I'm able to stand on the stage, because I stand on the shoulders of giants. And beyond that, recognize that this is a national election. What do you mean, Darrell? What are you talking about? We're in Portland. We're here in the United States of America. There's an election that's also going to be happening 
in a different part of the country. And it's going to affect everything here because politics is local. And when we recognize this and we have a community-based mechanism in our thinking, we can be able to better equip and strategize ourselves starting at home, la casa. That's where charity starts. And it goes even further to the one you look in the mirror every single day. As radically and vulnerable as I want to share with you all, my wife is here, and I'm blessed to have my wife here. I'm blessed to be married. I'm blessed to be committed. I have fallen short, and I'm accountable at home as well. So that is something that you are going to get from me, being vulnerable, being able to share with you all that I'm not playing any games with anybody at all, including myself. I want to get that straight because we need to be working with everyone in the state, everyone in the county, and at the federal level. We have to stop the drug dealers by working with the FBI. We can't be afraid to do that. Well, Mike in Oregon Recovers and the Recovery Summit, thank you for this important conversation. It's been a good day. It's been our first out of the gate. And by my count, you all took about a minute, so I get 10 minutes if I, my math is right. All right, maybe not. In Portland, our city has the highest unsheltered rate in the nation except for six cities in California. There are 4,000 people that are going to be living on the street tonight. There are 400 of them that are going to die, many from addiction. 400 are going to die this year, many from addiction. We're record or near record highs of overdoses, gun violence, homicides, car theft, property crime, and the list goes on. What have we become in Portland? What has this jewel of a city in the nation and the world become? What leadership and what policies have we brought forward that have addressed any of these? Because it's constantly beginning worse and worse and worse until we sit on this stage right now saying what we're going to do about Portland. I was in Boise on Thursday meeting with the former mayor. And he's on my leadership council for Shelter Portland. I have 10 national experts on my team, many of them who have ended unsheltered homelessness. And we put together a plan to end unsheltered homelessness in Portland. We have to start with that basic dignity of providing a basic shelter night for somebody instead of on your worst day you end up on the street and that's what we're going to do from day one when i am mayor real change is on the ballot this year as mayor i am going to end unsheltered homelessness we are going to care for our for our portlanders i have a plan i have a leadership council of experts who know how to deliver this change i have a record of success of delivering results and i'm asking you for your help i can't do this alone we have to do this together. We have to repair, restore, and revitalize our city. I need you to look towards this next eight months as you look at all of us and, and decide who's your candidate. Go deep. Make sure they articulate your vision of what you see for the city. What are we going to look like next year? Because we, we can't wait for another year and another year for a 50% reduction in unsheltered rate. We need a 100% reduction in unsheltered rate with 400 people that are going to die, who is it that wants to decide what 200 live and what 200 die? We can do this together. Please, uh, my website will be up next week, and I look for you to, uh, to join the campaign and, and the conversation. So thank you, all, all six of you. This has really been a rich conversation. It's great to hear you articulate a vision for addressing Oregon's addiction crisis. Um, and I want to urge all of you, particularly those of you who live in Portland, we're reinventing democracy here. And this year, the mayor's race is going to be determined through rank choice voting, and we have public financing. And so every one of these candidates, in order to qualify for public financing, has to get at least 250 donations of between 5 and, and $20. 750. Oh, that's, oh, okay, so... Uh, yeah, city council is 250, 750 donations. And so um, I think we might have everybody's QR code up on the screen um, for the, that'll take you to their campaign website. If you hear good things, reward these folks for, for articulating what you believe in by going to their website and giving them five, 10, $20, more if you can, um, because that will help them qualify 
for public financing, which will allow them to continue to be in the debate. And that's hugely important. We need to make this new system work. Um, and so, and you don't have to just pick one. We have ranked choice voting, and so you can have a number of candidates ultimately that you're, you're supporting, and that's, that's hugely important. Um, uh, lastly, as I said at the beginning, if you're not from Portland, go back to your city, go back to your county, and, and convene people and have a conversation about doing the exact same thing here with the uh, folks that are running, particularly in the legislature. Uh, I think we heard yesterday one of the speakers talk about the fact that a third of the legislature is going to turn over uh, in this session. That's really hard for those of us doing advocacy, but if we can get people in at the outset who understand our issues and campaign on our issues, then when and Jesse mobilizes all of us to go to Salem, um, we're going to have way more uh, effective representation to deal with. And so uh, take what you saw today, take it home and replicate it improve it, whatever the case may be. But let's give one big last recovery uh, appreciation for these six candidates.